Welcome to Hard Questions, where we gather pastors together to take on your tough questions and answer them right from the Bible. I'm Tom Hollis, the moderator, and today our panelists include... Dr. William R. Glaze, Bethany Baptist Church in Pittsburgh. Ray Heipel, Providence Presbyterian Church in Robinson Township. Pete Jacaloni, South Hills Assembly of God Church in Bethel Park, PA. G. Anthony Gilbert, pastor of Another Level in the North Hills area. Well, pastors, thank you for being with us today. We're going to take on questions today from the book of Genesis. Lots of interesting things in there. Uh, let's start with an audio question from our Hard Questions hotline right now. My question is this. I've had people ask me and I don't have an answer. Where did Cain get his wife and Noah's son after the flood, he had one son on board with him, with his wife that they rescued, but the other son after the ark landed, the other son took off and he started having children. Where did his wife come from? All right, I mean, this is a question that comes up. Uh, it comes up again and again and many times. Uh, yeah. Ray. The first one was made famous in that uh, Inherit the Wind movie back in like the 40s or and they were making fun of Christianity. You know, where did Cain get his wife? And this theologian on the witness stand is like, oh, I never heard of that. Oh, I'm, I must throw my Bible away now. I mean, uh, it's absurd. I don't think she's coming from it from that perspective. But sometimes people simplistically think, that they can refute scripture. Obviously, Cain got his wife from Adam and Eve. She was his sister. There's a good chance he was already married. The Bible just talks about Cain and Abel being born and then Seth, but it says Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters. Adam lived to be 930 years old. So Eve was probably at least that old. And if you multiply times 10, the range of having birth, because that's about times 10 is the lifespan, uh, Eve probably had hundreds of children hundreds of children and they would have you know spread out over the world so that's easy uh, the second one I think what's happening is the viewer the only place I know of that shows one of the sons of Noah didn't have a son or didn't have a wife is the movie Ooh, you know. Noah's yeah, Ark right. with, oh, Russell, you know. with, with, with Russell Crowe. Right. So right. don't get your theology from a movie, get it from scripture. <laughs> Clearly in the Bible they were all three married. Yes. Let yes. me give you the verses. Um, Genesis Chapter 6, 18, I will establish my covenant with you and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives, unless we say, well, maybe that's only two, Genesis 7, 13, on that very same day, Noah and his Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife, and the three wives yes. of his sons with them entered the ark. So, you know, my apologies to Hollywood, but <laughs> Ham had a wife. She got on the ark with him. And even if we're just not sure there, go to 1 Peter 4.20. Yes. Who yes. formerly, while they were disobedient, when the, when the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. Noah, his wife, Shem, Ham, Japheth, Mrs. Shem, Mrs. Ham, Mrs. Japheth. There they are, all eight of them on the all ark. Right, all right. Now, wait a minute, though. Uh, getting back Eat to the, the first... Eat and having wine. Well, you know, <laughs> well, getting back to the first part of that, though, uh, well, what about, it seems incestuous then? Okay. Uh, what about, you know, is Cain marrying his sister then? Absolutely. Well, okay. So yeah. I want to let someone else, yes. you know, talk on Well, on yeah. Uh, yeah, he is marrying his sister. But you, uh, you, know, you got to look back. I think... The closer we get to the original creation, that the, 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 the genetic system of the body, you know, I, I, this is what I believe, took a, into account, you know, the fact that, you know, you were going to, you know, be marrying someone of, of close proximity gene, uh, genealogically. As you move away from the original couple, I think, in, and as sin, you know, was manifest in the body, and I think that it, the further you got away, that that's when the genetic uh, makeup began to, you know, cause, cause problems and then it began to be wrong. So, I, you know, I would say, you know, that from the, initially that, you know, it, it got, you know, God didn't count it as incest, incest, but, you know, the further that you got away from the original couple that I think that, you know, and, and you go into the law of Moses because Moses began to, yes. you know, point things like that out. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that that's where it actually became incestuous. Okay. Okay. Any any other thoughts, Pete, on this? No, I agree with yeah. both my brothers. I, okay. I, I think they. Is that is that the point it. you would take on it, Ray? That it will because of the 
the more purity of the gene pool or whatever? Or the... Yeah, I think the commandment of incest doesn't kick in. Right. It doesn't become that. I mean, Abraham marries half his sister. Right. You know, but that was somewhat unheard of at the time. But, you know, you do see that. And, um, but by the time of the law of Moses, God says, no, you can't do that uh, anymore. And so I think, again, uh, kosher laws, same thing. Up until the time of Moses, there's nothing that says the godly people couldn't have eaten pork and shellfish and everything else. So God has certain seasons for certain laws. But uh, today, yes, it's wrong to marry your sister, but that's the way God designed it at well, the beginning. It, it, if I could jump in there, just say one more thing about uh, Cain getting his wife, that, you know, we read in the scripture uh, what's recorded, but I think there's a lot that it's not in there. You yeah. know, and so, you know, we just kind of got the highlight, you know, of yeah. Cain, Abel. But, you know, you know, had we got a more, you know, uh, detailed history, it probably would go into, you know, description as to, you know, where they got their wives from, the children that they had. So I think that, you know, we look at what we read in the scripture and we say that, well, you know, this is all that there is. But there yeah. probably was a lot more history that, that, that was recorded. Right. And, and we take that by faith, that what's in there, what, what's not in there, God knows what that is. But right. Jay, I'm going to move on to the next question here for you. What is the significance of the number seven in Genesis 7? Well, I think with all uh, biblical numerology, I mean, you know, there's certain standard things you can govern by, like seven being the number of completion, seven being the number of perfection, all of those things. Um, uh, but, you know, it really, there's a lot of places you can go with that. I mean, it talks about how he said, take seven of the clean beasts and, and it talks about how seven more days it's going to rain. And uh, it's in Genesis chapter seven. I think a lot of times when you're looking at stuff like that, it's a preacher's dream to, at least for me, to ex <laughs> exegetically pull stuff out of there, you know, because there's so much that I could do with that. Uh, in one place here it says, for after seven more days, I will cause it to rain on the earth 40 days. And they told him to take seven of every clean beast. And I mean, it goes on and on, just all the different sevens in there. So I believe he's all symbolic. For me, it's, it's all about a completion. Uh, the seven is uh, just around completion, perfection. Uh, of course, he took seven, in my opinion, took seven of the clean beasts uh, because obviously you needed those also for sacrifice mm -hmm. and things. I mean, but there's so many things you could go into uh, when it comes to that. But uh, all in all, though, I believe it's, it was a completed time where God says, I'm going to start things over again. Okay. So that's my take, but I'm sure they could exegetically well, put well, a lot I more wanna, out of I want to well. kind of broaden this a little bit because we've got a little bit of time here. What is this about biblical numbers? Because I've heard people say, well, 40 means this, and 12 means that, and 10 means this. And I always say, 40 means one more than 39. I mean, <laughs> I, don't, I don't get it. Why, why, what is it about numbers? Maybe Pete, you can comment on this. Uh, Again, like Jay said, there are people out there who, who get into what they call numerology. And yeah. then in, in the Hebrew, it's not, it, Hebrew is three languages. It's pictographic, uh, and Hebrew is a perfect, pure language, and it's also uh, each number, each letter uh, is a corresponding a, has number. Cor so, yeah. uh, and I've seen some great studies out, oh, yeah. uh, no, no. pictographically and numerically, how you could take a word and just see so much there, so much meat that's there. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not against those folks that get into numerology. Uh, I just want to get the people in the word. You know what I mean? Right. And, and, and get into that word, and 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 I think. I think you could really chase that rabbit down a rabbit hole that, that you, you know, this number and, and sometimes and maybe find things that really aren't there. Yeah, yeah. That's always been my, my concern is that we get our eyes on these numbers rather than on, on the actual yeah. things that we need to know. Any other thoughts about well, that? Well, you know, I think where the Bible is clear that, you know, we can be dogmatic. You know, for instance, the Bible says that the number of man is six. Right. So, you know, we, we know what six represents. Uh, the Bible was very clear, as Ray pointed out, that seven is the number of completion. Mm -hmm. I think that where the Bible was clear, we can be clear. And where, you know, because again, uh, like you said, Pete, we can go down all kind of rabbit holes as far as this yeah. is concerned. That's and right. I think, that, I think we need to be careful that uh, I see, I hear that sometimes in, in, in people's voices and, and they want to, this number, that number, before you know it, they're, they got more numbers in the bookie. Well, here's a number for you, 60. We're going to be back in 60 <laughs> seconds. We're going to talk about why did God allow Satan to afflict Job so severely? Welcome back to Hard Questions. We're talking about the book of Genesis. Here's our next question. 
Why did God take Enoch? What does that mean? Was there something special about him over everyone else? Pastor Glaze. Well, you know, the Bible says that Enoch walked with God. Mm. And I heard the old preacher say that they walked one day yes. and uh, yes. they got to the end of the day yeah. and uh, God looked at Enoch and said, we're closer to my house than yours, so just come home with me. <laughs> wow. And, uh, and uh, God also said uh, in the words of Gladys Knight, neither one of us want to be the first to say goodbye. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Gladys Knight has come making an appearance on hard questions. Are the, so, pips, are the pips far yeah, behind? Uh, yeah, no, no. Uh, if, if we go to uh, Hebrews chapter 11, yes. it says by faith Enoch was translated. That means that he was raptured, that he was mm -hmm. taken out of this world, that he should not see death. And he was found not because God translated him. Before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that in his walk with God, Amen. that he was righteous. Mm -hmm. and, and, and again, you know, I often tell people that, you know, nobody's perfect. I think that if you're perfect, you know, God will just go ahead and take you on to heaven. But, you know, probably if there was a guy who was as close to perfect mm -hmm. as could be, it probably was Enoch. And, uh, and, and God just, just took him. And I believe another reason God took him because of his faith, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because in the very next verse says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Enoch, you know, had a strong walk with God and he had a great faith in God. And I believe that that was the basis for the translation. That's really good. I, I immediately went to the amplified version in, in Genesis and man, I, I fell in love with it. Enoch walked in habitual fellowship with God 300 years after the birth of Methuselah and had other sons. So all the days of Enoch were 360 and in reverent fear and obedience. I mean, there, there's something about this man's walk with God that, that God said, you know what, son, I love, I've, I've preached that story many times. Yeah. You know what, son, come on, we're close to my house. Come on home. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's pretty good. Jay. Well, you know, I also think too, and now this is an exegetical thing. This is thus saith Jay. Uh, and I'm not saying this is definitely Bob, but I've wondered because he was so close to the time where he got into with Noah and all of that. Did God, pause? he one of the uh, witnesses that will return back because oh, he had that ability to walk in a wicked time and please God. Uh, and that that type of man would be needed. Not that God couldn't cultivate. I'm just saying this is exegetical. Just, sure. you know, don't call me a heretic and send me a bunch of emails and all that. <laughs> I mean, just something that I looked at because no one knows who those two witnesses are going to be. But the Bible says the point of the man wants to die and then the judgment. Well, there's only two men that we know in the scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, that did not die. It was Elijah yeah. and Enoch. And so Enoch, just knowing the day that he lived in, same with Elijah. Very wicked times. Two men that walked with God in a special time. I wonder if God said, I'm going to pull you out and place you back in at another time, that's you know, uh, and that's just my little take on it. So um, that's my thought. The only thing I would add, and, and I really appreciate the answers, is that, um, yes, it was his godliness and his faith, as you guys all said, but I think scripture is showing us something else, too. We just talked about numbers. Um, if you count the seventh son of Adam mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. Seth mm -hmm. is Enoch, uh, and the seventh son of Adam through Cain is Lamech who murders a man right. and who takes two wives. And so you get the fullness of the, of the seed of the serpent mm. and you get the well, fullness of the seed of the woman, okay. which was the gospel in Genesis 3.15. The seed uh, you know, of, the, of the serpent and the seed of the woman would um, be hostile mm. to one another. And, and, you, and God traces out those two lines. We get the genealogy of Cain and the genealogy of Seth. And, and again, the, the prime examples, Enoch versus Lamech, the godly one that God took home and the wicked one who corrupts marriage and who murders a man for insulting him. Wow, that's a really good take on that. Thank you. It's an interesting question. Well, let's go to the next one. Why did God allow Satan to afflict Job? Does that prove that the Lord will afflict us? Really interesting a second half of this, Pete. What do you, what do you, uh, what do you have to say on well, this? I, I don't want to sound super spiritual here, but uh, I think Job chapter 1, verse 1, really, God was so proud of his servant Job. And the Bible says, this is what the Bible says, there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and a man was blameless, upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. So that's what, what it says there. And then if you drop down to verse 8, God says the exact same thing about Job. 1, 8, then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job that there's none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? I mean, for God to, to, to be bragging on a man 
it, it's simply amazing. So I, you know, I really believe with all of my heart, God knew that Job was going to come through with flying colors. Uh, and um, I, I don't believe so much that, you know, because again, we think, will God do that to us? If God does it to us, if he brought you in, he'll bring you out. Uh, so if, if we go into a tough situation, because many people fear that, you know, people in our congregation, will God do to me what he did to Job? God will never leave you nor forsake you. That's, That's the bottom right. line there. So I, I believe God, uh, uh, it was a purification process, and I believe Job came out on top. So as we will come up on top, as long as we continue to trust in the Lord with all our heart. Yeah, I, I think that we have to continue that discussion, though, because that's a great answer. But it will. Their affliction happens. Right. A horrible right. affliction sometimes. Right. Where do you go well, with that? Well, I, I heard a preacher uh, preach a message one time, and he said, God will give you double for your trouble. And if you look at the last chapter of the book of Job, yes, yes. God doubled everything that, that Job had, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and so that I, I think what you see here is the sovereignty of God at work. Yes. I mean, uh, you know, was there other righteous servants walking the face of the earth at that time? There probably was, but it was God's sovereign choice to, uh, if, if you will, put Job on front street and, and let Satan have access to his life. Uh, knowing that, you know, God was going to be working in Job's life. And, and again, I believe what Pete said, that God knew uh, Job's heart. And he knew that, because uh, Job even said, the Lord knows my heart. And he knows that when I've tri been tried, I will come forth as gold. And, right. and so, you know, I believe that it was, a, it was about a, uh, a purification and testing and confirmation of, of Job's uprightness. Yeah. In the world, you will have tribulation, Trials right? But, but take courage, I've overcome the world. Right. One thing I don't like about the question, the way it says it is, why did God allow Satan to afflict Job? Does that prove that the Lord will right. afflict us? Yeah, well, the yeah. Lord wasn't afflicting Job. Right. He was no, exactly. letting Satan afflict him. So clearly God's not going to afflict us either if it means for our harm. Does God chasten his people when they're wayward? Yes. Does he test them at times? And this was a test from the part of God. Obviously it was an affliction from the part of Satan. And, and I think that that's something that God does do um, at times. But if he does test you, as you said, Pete, I mean, if you're really his, that will come through. And whatever you suffer, you'll be rewarded for. Just a couple of verses. Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are, are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil things against you. Rejoice and be glad for great is your reward in heaven. Uh, and Peter says the same things, rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed and that, you know, suffering produces endurance. And so, yes. you know, yes, there's hardships in our lives, but if we trust in Christ, it's going to be for our reward in heaven. And it's going to be that we show forth his glory even now. And, uh, and, and it's a great privilege to suffer for Christ. So, you know, I think one of the things too that you have to look at is that uh, before Job was ever afflicted, if you're going to have that type of affliction, you've got to have that type of hedge. Yes. Job yes. had a hedge around about him. He did. And so there was a difference between some people just going through stuff because they make bad decisions. Mm -hmm. Job, the Bible says he had a hedge. The Bible says that Satan couldn't even get to him. Mm -hmm. And God allowed that to be lifted. So to understand this and really grasp it, you have to understand God, Job was greatly beloved of God. Oh, amen. Greatly beloved. He wouldn't have been that protected. Yeah. So for me going into it, understand it. Will the Lord allow us to go through things like that? If he's allowing the hedge to be lifted, I have to trust the same God that had the hedge there mm -hmm. because he wouldn't put me in all of that if he didn't have his hand all around me and, he, and I wasn't greatly beloved of God. So it's hard to preach it because nobody wants to go through that stuff. But mm -hmm. as long as I had the hedge up front, I'm all right. <laughs> and you know, that was Satan's complaint. He goes, you've put, can't I, can't, I can't touch him. I can't touch his wife. Matter of fact, I'm not even allowed on his property. Yeah. yeah well, you know, it's interesting because a friend of mine who's a, Ch a native Chinese, he, he talked about how in China, they have a theology of suffering that we don't really have here oh, because of no. the suffering that they've been through. It's an interesting, uh, interesting take on that. Uh, sometimes our experience uh, helps us or hinders us when we're trying to get at God's purposes. Well, good answers, everyone. Coming up in 60 seconds when we take a hotline question of the week. Welcome back to Hard Questions. Let's go to our audio question of the week. 
Yes, I would like to know if you could explain in Genesis where the Lord said, let us make you in our image. What does he say? What is he talking about when he says our image? Is he talking about Jesus? Explain, please. All right. This is a, uh, an interesting scripture that I've always uh, had a thought on. But, Ray, what, what, what's your take on this? Yeah, yes, I think God is. Um, it's interesting in the creation account, this is the first time where God sort of pauses and has a conversation with himself. And that only happens a few times in scripture. And every time it does, it's very significant. And so God's about to make you know, the crowning piece of his creation. And he says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And I think God is triune. And even though that's not clearly revealed in the Old Testament, we, we find it in places like this where God speaks of himself in the plural. And I know the other arguments, the royal plural and all that. No, God is eternally Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God can't be talking to the angels because it never says we're made in the image of angels. God would never include them in, in the category us, let us do something as if we're equal. So that is, the, that is the Trinity. And to be made in God's image is to be a rational, reasonable, intellectual creature who can create and who can also is moral and can do what is good and right. This is what it means to be like God. And, and ultimately Christ is the fulfillment of that image because you know, Christ, uh, we are renewed after the image of Christ in knowledge, Colossians 3.10, and in righteousness and in holiness, Ephesians 4.24. So that's the promise. We will be like, like Christ again. We, we got corrupted in the fall. We didn't entirely lose the image. We're still human. Uh, but we're sinful now, but Christ is the goal and that's what God is making us into right now. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a good answer. And that, I like that, that point of he's not talking to the angels because I think people have said that. But Pete. Well, you go back to Genesis 1, in the beginning Elohim, which is, shows plurality, mm -hmm. three in one. And, and uh, like, like Ray said, so he was talking to the Godhead there and, and we are created in the image and the likeness of God. When you think about God being created in His image, maybe I'll move over to Pastor Glaze. What do you, what's that mean when we're created in His image? Well, I think it means several things. You know, His, his uh, intellectual image, you know, man's ability to reason, uh, his social image, the fact that there is uh, fellowship among the Trinity. Uh, but I believe that the main thing is talking about is His uh, authoritative image. Uh, and, and we see that in Psalm 8, where it says that he made him a little lower than the angels uh, that he might have, uh, let's see here, thou hast made him that he may have dominion over the works of thy hands and all that have put under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, beasts of the earth, fowl of the air, fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the sea. So, you know, we, we were made in the image of God to have authority over, over the creation. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's, uh, to me, that's first and foremost, the image of God is that, that authority that we have. But then again, it's the, the, the mental uh, image, the social, uh, the emotional, uh, you know, I think that it's, it's reflected in those areas. All right. That's good. That's good. Jay? Uh, just real quickly, I think that uh, when it's talking about that too, I, I know I think we've talked about this before and it depends on if you believe that you have a spirit and a soul or if they're one. I believe personally in the trichotomy of man, that man is a spirit, possesses a soul, mind, will, and emotion, lives in a body. So in Genesis 126, it let us make man in our image. God doesn't have a physical body, you know, so he's a spirit. So he created the spirit of the man, I believe, at that point. And then in uh, Genesis 2, I believe it is verse 7, it said he breathed into his nostrils, I believe, what he created. He breathed into his nostrils what he created because he formed man out of the dust of the ground in verse 7 of chapter 2. And then he said he breathed into his nostrils that spirit being, and then man became a living soul. So that's why I believe also in its lowest form, that is how man is created uh, in the image of God. And then as a result of that, all the attributes that you explained, I believe come along with the creation of man uh, as a result of that. So that's what I believe uh, when it's talking about creating man in his image, that's why it looks like that. That's a good point. Any, any other points on this? We good? We're good. We all believe in the Trinity and we all, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Nobody all believe. Hell. yeah, <laughs> all right. That's good. That's a, that's a good, it's, the Trinity is one of those more difficult to explain, but I like what you said, Ray. Here's one of those peaks in the Old Testament where we're seeing that. We're actually seeing the, the, the Trinity, uh, ex, you know, at least a, a peek into the conversation among the Godhead. That, that is great. Well, we like to end the program with the scripture. And today we go to Proverbs where it says, the highway of the upright 
is to depart from evil. Who keeps his way, he who keeps his way preserves his soul. Now I'm going to take a, uh, ask you guys to give me a, a quick response on this. What do you think about this particular uh, verse, Pastor Glaze? I, I like that phrase, the highway of the upright. Mm -hmm. You know, just the, traveling up the king's highway. Okay. Amen. And, and then there's got to be a, a depart, a departure from mm -hmm. evil. Yeah. So as we, that's on our part. God saves, sanctifies, does all that part, but we are to turn our back. You know, isn't that what repentance really means? Headed in one direction and turn around, headed in another direction. Depart from evil. Ten There's seconds. Preservation <laughs> in the highway. Preservation in the highway. And we are to walk the road of righteousness and godliness, and you know that's what this is talking about. We all sin, but the godly man walks that upright highway. That this is what this is what it's like to be in the image of God. To to, to seek to do things that are right. It's interesting how often they uh, use a walk along a road to describe our relationship with God. Well, we hope you enjoyed today's program, and we want to hear from you. Email us your questions to hardquestions at ctvn.org or call into our hotline at 412-349-4326. God has got good and wonderful things for you in this volume. Study your Bible.